No, this is a this is a very wide conceptual question. I mean, should we, or should the West, or should other countries uh, talk with organizations that are considered either terrorist or criminal or non-state or etc.? Of course, if we take a strict definition of international law and etc., cautious is caution is required. However, um, I mean, the recent experience everywhere has shown that. If you don't engage with the parties or the non-state actors that have uh, enough, let's say, spoiling capacity to at least impeach or at least, let's say, uh, impede a political process, you will have uh, problems along the, uh, along the road. So you have a vested interest in putting them in, in engaging with them, at least in order to facilitate the peace building uh, process. The second reason is that Ultimately, uh, you, you cannot build institutions solid enough in countries that are diverse, heterogeneous, and etc., like Lebanon, if these institutions are not inclusive enough. Uh, and here we have to acknowledge that Hezbollah is a genus, in fact. It has at least two faces. It has the face of a militia resistance organization, some people could call it terrorist organization, let's call it the arm branch of Hezbollah. And you have the Hezbollah, which is a social political body, very strongly entrenched and very deeply rooted in the Shia community in Lebanon. And it is today, we like it or not, the representative of a main part of the Shia community. So if you want to rebuild a lasting peace in Lebanon, including this community, which is on the rise today on all levels, political, economic, uh, cultural, and etc., you have to address its uh, appointed representative and interlocutor. So you have to tackle uh, the problem of Hezbollah by taking its political, social, economic side and by trying to find a solution to its uh, weaponized, let's say, uh, side. But if you approach the weaponized side, the armed side of Hezbollah in an aggressive way, you miss uh, the other point. So engagement is a way to demobilize Hezbollah in a method that for instance, I take an example, the Irish IRA was, uh, were, was approached in the, in the Irish uh, British peace process, for instance. One can envisage the uh, Taif agreement as a macro or super ceasefire more than a peace agreement that has uh, really put an end to the war and also more than a constitutional device that has uh, laid the foundations of the Second Republic in Lebanon. Uh, it was a regional slash international uh, intervention on the Lebanese crisis to put an end to it and it was superimposed on the Lebanese factions that were battling. Uh, by um, giving or empowering Syria uh, the capacity and the prerogative to rebuild Lebanon. So this is the first big pillar of the Taif Agreement. The second pillar of the Taif Agreement is that it has, in terms of inter the, the internal, the, the domestic power structure of Lebanon, it has transferred the, uh, what was considered as the uh, very wide prerogatives of the Maronite community, what we call the Maronite hegemon on Lebanon's uh, institutions to a tandem of Shia and Sunni uh, communities. And uh, this balance of power between the Sunnis and the Shias have, uh, has remained, in fact, unstable and fluctuant under the Syrian tutelage. And this is the second pillar of the Taif Agreement. The third pillar of the Taif Agreement is that, in fact, it has kept a link between the situation within Lebanon, the domestic situation in Lebanon, and the regional situation, i.e. the Arab-Israeli process, because Hezbollah was left aside the disarmament process that was touching the militias under the label of resistance, meaning, namely, uh, the right for Syria to use Hezbollah in order to ameliorate the balance of power with Israel. These are the three pillars of the Taif Agreement. By definition, if you look at each of them, it is, uh, they are, all of them, they are evolutionary and they are subject and function to changes in the environment. This environment has, in fact, really changed in 2003 with the war on Iraq since the American intervention in the region has completely put an end to this Western permissivity given to Syria, first. Second, with the breakup of the Iraqi state and the beginning of 
really the heightening uh, of the Sunni Shia tension in the region. The Sunni Shia tension in Lebanon, which was frozen, was completely unleashed and open again. And uh, third, uh, the Hezbollah issue became a conflictual issue between the West and Syria, Iran, and Lebanon. So this argument of Hezbollah became a, a worldwide international demand that put uh, the Lebanese, uh, let's say, agreement or the Ta'if uh, status quo under strain. So since 2003, and then mainly since 2005 with the assassination of Rafid Hariri, and then with the Arab revolutions, we can consider that the Ta'if agreement, in fact, has become moribund, and today it is clinically dead, without any other structure that is able to, uh, to replace it. Lebanon has always been very sensitive to regional environment fluctuations, and today it is more sensitive than ever. First of all, because the Arab revolutions have reopened all the old questions that Lebanon have thought uh, that it, I mean, it has uh, that, that that Lebanon thought were closed for a moment. The question of Arab identity of the country, the question of Islam and the minorities, the question of uh, modernity and tradition and etc. Second, uh, the Arab Spring and the Arab Revolution have also stirred the phobias and the fears of several minorities in Lebanon. Uh, so they are uh, again uh, in search or in quest of a proper political formula that could uh, give them security. They thought that the consociational system in Lebanon could be that uh, solution or that answer. However, the war in Lebanon was a kind of negative answer to that. So today they don't really have a proper political framework or reference in order to uh, think about uh, their future and their, uh, their, uh, I mean, uh, their survival in the future. And the third reason, which is a very proximal reason, is the situation properly in Syria. Syria is no more a revolution. It is becoming more and more a state of, let's call it civil strife, if we don't want to call it civil war. And in that case, uh, due to the high porosity between Lebanon and Syria, the high level of entanglement of the two dynamics or the dynamics in the two societies and countries, one can very, I mean, uneasily see that Syria can go down that road without Lebanon being affected. So at one point, Lebanon's equilibrium will be affected, especially that they are already shaking, as uh, I mean we have mentioned uh, before. So for all these reasons, the regional environment today uh, around Lebanon is an environment of high anxiety, and uh, this fragile equilibrium that the Ta'if agreement has provided for Lebanon, especially between the Shia and the Sunnis, who are today the main uh, contenders to power in Lebanon, is a uh, kind of open game, and uh, one can fear that this account would be settled by uh, violent means. Exactly. I think uh, medias can play both both ways. I mean, the media can play uh, the role of uh, awareness and consciousness and building a trans-sectarian political culture through a unified discourse, through uh, rising, let's say, uh, awareness about the stakes uh, that are uh, uh, common for all the Lebanese. And at the same time, uh, media can play the role of, uh, on the contrary, inflaming, infuriating, uh, caressing, let's say, the uh, sectarian instincts and going in, a, in a, the direction of flattering the gregarious, let's say, tendencies of, of communities. Unfortunately, the uh, mediatic landscape in Lebanon and the experience of the of this mediatic landscape in Lebanon after the war is more towards the second direction, i.e. The, the negative direction, at least because the, the distribution of the, uh, of the mediatic uh, shares of the pie has been a sectarian distribution, meaning that every community has more or less its own TV and papers and radios and etc. And in, within which, uh, within each community, every sect, every party, and etc., has its own, uh, let us say, uh, porte voix, its own, uh, its own uh, buffer, its own, uh, let's say, uh, amplifier. 
And uh, these uh, media channels, these media vectors, are playing, in fact, completely uh, the role of mobilizing around uh, sectarian slogans, uh, around uh, factional interests, and etc. So it is uh, unfortunately playing today a very, let's say, a more negative role than uh, a positive role. I would say. Due to, I mean, if you compare Lebanon to its neighbors uh, and the role the social media played in the Arab revolutions in Egypt, in Tunis, and etc. Uh, there's a paradox because Lebanon was supposed, or at least Lebanon is tended to be perceived as a more modern country, more accessible to social media and to IT and etc. Whereby, in fact, the experience has shown the contrary. Lebanon is still lacking behind, uh, lagging behind in terms of access to these media. Of course, they exist, but I think the civil society has not taken um, enough the opportunity and did not seize them enough yet in order to mobilize and probably to try to overcome the imbalance of power in its favor due to the uh, I mean, lot, I mean, big amount of money that is poured uh, from uh, the side of, uh, of powerful conservative forces and etc. So IT and social media could have provided uh, a way to balance that gain for uh, the Lebanese civil society. The hope is that they will seize uh, this uh, this opportunity soon, and probably they have to be maybe trained or uh, made aware of that in order to seize it more efficiently.